Shalom, come Shabbatai. I said Shalom, come Shabbatai. Baal Hashem, Abba Hawah, Yahawashua. Baal Hashem, Abba Hawah, Yahawashua. For vibrating this Yapa ether. This Yapa levitation. I just wanna I just wanna just vibrate your mem. Let me vibrate your mem for a second with words of vibration. As you can see our beautiful land, Shekinah. It's all from the heart, Shekinah. Wisdom for solid breath. A how, a hava, love. Torah is the heart within the world, the heart within the law. Yahshua is the law, the promised land. Marut, Shambhala, America. America, Mexico, Mount Shasta, Kalelus. Deca, Omex, this is the Hawaiadin, Mount Verema, the Yucatans. This is that tree of life, the Tokef Benak. This is a place where Tukamesh, Tenskawata, Moshe, Kesakota, <laughs> this is the promised land. Kef Benah This is the land The official land of the Chamisha Chumshe Yeah, 
Shalom. I just want to touch bases on a couple things that uh, that we already touched on, but we can remember that uh, from that video from BET <clears throat> as far as Hebrews going over to Israel in 1970, all uh, right, in '73, and, and still to this day have been waiting to uh, to obtain citizenship in Israel. So why were the black Jews the last to arrive in Israel? I mean, that's a question that you can just pile on the other type of questions you have uh, that the indigenous so-called Negro in America has. Those are just one of the questions. But we want to just keep a reminder, Psalms 147, 19 and 20. Hawa showed his word to Jacob. Hawa's statues and judgments unto Israel. We want to remember that. Okay, Hawa had not dealt. He had not dealt so with any nation in his judgments. They have not known them. No other nation. So praise Hawa. And also remember that Deuteronomy 32, circumcision is from the heart. Alright. Circumcision is from the heart. <clears throat> from the heart. And not from the, uh, you know, not from the other place. Alright. Remember, Yahshua said, I am not sent. I am not sent, but until the lost sheep of Israel. Salvation is only for Israel. Alright. So yeah, I want us to cover some basic topics that we already went over, but it's just another hitting them over the head. So I want to hit you over the head with some food, man. With some real shit. With some real shit now. With some real spill. Alright. So I mean, we're just going to be talking about a few things as far as losing the land, rejecting the New Testament, um, signing treaties. Uh, treaties that were signed, making allies against against us. Um, I'm gonna talk about Pharaoh and um, how he killing all all of our children, all the male children. How that was a, a doctrine, a a, a a a decree. Talk about the false Jews in Israel, and we want to talk about how we were treated in the religion, and we want to talk about what's also missing what's missing in the Hebrew what's missing in Israel all right so we want to run through this man and and I don't already told you this so I just got a couple youtubers just to just to let you know so get the food man get the food we trying to fill our tummies up and this is just vibration all right Shalom my people Shalom the Jews that are in Israel today are not the Hebrew Israelites. The, Jew the Jews that are over there today are actually the ones that have funded slavery. They uh, run our media. They run our um, Wall Street. They run everything. Um, music. They run music. They run all of it. A uh, Jewish name is on everything that controls our country um, and people just they, they don't look at what the prophecy has said they don't look at what revelation says it says that they're the people in Israel um, will claim that they're Israelites and they're not um, Psalms 83 talks about um, the different nations that would cut off Israel as a nation and um, we all have been brought up um, to think that the white race is superior because of that. We have been brought up to serve a white God, a white Jesus. And uh, Just for it, I wanted to go over to Psalms 83 if you don't mind. Psalms 83 verse 4 They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance for they have consulted together with one consent 
they are confederate against thee okay so that means that they signed a treaty okay they signed treaty as allies against you okay the tabernacles of Edom and Ishmael and Moab and Hagarins okay and the Philistines and Jabal Ammonites Amalekites and the inhabitants of Tari and also uh, Ashur Asur also joined with them and the children of Lot alright the Ammonites the Amalekites the people of the Philistine and Tyre Assyria also joined them too and is allied with the descendants of Lot that's not the way that it is um, when Jerusalem was overtaken by Assyria the tribe of Judah went into hiding into Africa there are tribes still in Africa now that believe and go by the Hebrew laws um, and when Africa sold their people that, they, that everyone has come to think that that's the way that it was that is not what happened Africa did not sell their people they sold the people who were different than them they sold the Hebrew Israelites that were hiding the people that are here the black people the people of color that are here that have been brought here from Africa their ancestors brought here from Africa all the Hebrew Israelites um, they're even in the uh, African dictionary African and Negro are two different things are two different classifications of people um, the Africans were the tribe of Ham. Ham was not a Israelite. Um, the people that were brought here was the true Hebrew Israelites. <clears throat> Exodus um, chapter 1, and I wanted to share a little bit of what took place prior to the rise of Moses. Um, when I read that, it talked about that the Pharaoh um, became concerned and very um, fearful that the Hebrew slaves were growing in number and in power. So in order to maintain their oppression, um, he put upon them great labor. He put upon the Hebrew slaves cruelty to keep them down. However, they still grew. And so he brought together some midwives and he instructed them that when a Hebrew boy was born kill him well these midwives did not follow and the Hebrew slaves continued to grow eventually the Pharaoh became so hatred and, and uh, towards those Hebrew slaves that he made a decree he put out an order that male baby boy Hebrew slaves were to be killed by casting them into the Nile River. Let's look at America. Which is the Mississippi River. Alright. We brought blacks into this country as slaves. We never intended them to be anything other now you people gotta understand that when they talk about where they brought blacks into the slave, we know the numbers of Africans that was over here. But you gotta remember um, that a lot of your your key your key uh, uh, foundational ledgers, uh, even in the scriptures, a lot of your tribes ran to Egypt. Okay, ran to Egypt to hide, ran to uh, these other countries to hide to blend in with other blacks and were captured there and brought back to America brought back that's why you have so much foundational ledger that says that you came from Africa because you ran over to Africa to hide and were brought back to Americas okay some of us so uh, we went here um, a lot of places look at um, 
the uh, Americans that hid in Europe and they wrote letters. I think that was um, uh, W.E. Du Bois was writing letters back to the American government, I mean United States government, but they was telling him to uh, the people over in Europe to, um, they had to pay for his freedom. Some friends over in Europe had to pay for his freedom because he had ran to Europe and escaped slavery. And they were telling him that he had to come back here and be um, uh, do back for to be enslaved. So um, a lot of us ran to uh, across continents. A lot of us ran, but we were enslaved back in the Americas and we were brought back here to be slaves. So check it out. Than a slave. But they began to grow in number and in power, and eventually they fought their way to some freedom. So we became even more cruel, and to keep our black Americans down, we lynched. But yet they rose. So then we used the welfare system, the criminal justice system, to to keep them down, to contain them, to destroy them, but yet they rose and they're rising. It's been awful how they did us on religion. And our people tend to think that even those who feel that they know that white Americans have mistreated us, their grandchildren or great-grandchildren, still mistreating us in a lot of ways. They still believe we but nobody would lie about God when that's not true. People who are trying to subjugate another people and turn them into slaves, not just physically, but mentally, then uh, they certainly would try to uh, teach them that God looks like me. A lot of people say it doesn't matter what Jesus looked like, it doesn't matter what God looked like or other deity, but the thing is, if it did not matter what Jesus looked like, why don't they show what the original paintings and pictures of Jesus look like? Why don't they show what the original paintings and pictures of the disciples look like? Because that's very important to know if it doesn't matter. Michelangelo was told by the Pope to put the picture of the Holy Family on the, on, on the roof of the chapel. Michelangelo said he, that, and the Pope specifically told him to make it European. Michelangelo explained to him that there are no models of a European Holy Family. And so he said, you'll think of something, and he did. He used his, his family. We thought the only guy we had was the one that white people gave us, which was Jesus, okay? And he looked like them. And uh, when we saw them, psychologically, we were transferred that that was deity. If it really was unimportant what he looked like, then why didn't he look like some of the other, the majority of the people on earth? Why would he look like the people who are the minority race on the entire earth? some you know we always gonna love the land I want to get into something that was hit over that I was hit over the head with in the ether man y'all hold on to your seat belts it's a, a fate worse than slavery unearthed and sugar land Bodies of sugarcane workers recently discovered in Texas reveal gruesome details about the convict leasing program. Now y'all remember those convict leasing programs after slavery where we didn't have nowhere to go? Kicked off, off the land after slavery, didn't own any land, didn't have a job, didn't have anything didn't own anything sharecropping didn't get us anything we didn't own anything so we were sent to these prisons they were called convict leasing system systems uh we're gonna break it down so this is discovered in texas to reveal gruesome details all right about it in the sugar cane fields let's check it out this was in the new york times actually in uh october 27th 2018 
Okay, this is the Imperial Prison Farm Cemetery. Has 31 marked graves of inmates and guards dating back from 1912, after slavery, after the emancipation, to 1943. All right, and I'll tell you why. Let's read it. The blood-drenched history that gave the city of Sugar Land, Texas, its name showed its face earlier this year when a school construction crew construction crew discovered the remains of 95 of African Americans, as they say, right? But we know these are these are Amaru Khans. These are Americans whose unmarked graves date back more than a century. A hundred years. The dead, some of whom may have been born in slavery, are victims of an infamous convict leasing system that arose after emancipation. Southerners sought to replace slave labor by jailing Americans, American ex-slaves, on trumped-up charges and turning them over to, among others, sugarcane plantationers in the region once known as Sugar Bowl of Texas. Yeah, y'all check into that. A bitter debate has erupted in the Sugar Land, a fast-growing suburb southwest of Houston. Sugar Land's officials who want to move the remains to a nearby cemetery are at odds with members of a city-appointed task force who rightly argue that the historical find of this magnitude should be memorialized on the spot where it was discovered. Yes, of course, but they don't want to because we know the land has something to do with it. Them being buried on this land um, and being forced to work in these sugarcane fields, that's, that's evidence. So they don't want, they want to remove the evidence from where it is so they can make up evidence. So we can't let them do that. All right. So a display of at the Sugarcane Land Heritage Museum and Visitor Center, a center convicts uh, at center convicts harvesting sugarcane circa in 1900. Okay. So this you can see us in the fields at 1900 in the sugarcane fields. All right. Against this backdrop, archaeologists who are constructing an increasingly detailed portrait of the injuries and illness suffered by these inmates have, a op have opened a window into a murderous nature of sugar cultivation, an industry that earned its reputation as a slaughterhouse of the transatlantic and the Mesopotamia, slave trade by killing more people more rapidly than any other kind of agriculture. Okay, Lives of Living Death. The historian David Eltis, a co-editor of the Transatlantic Slave Trade database, estimates that at least 70% of, of the 12 million or so captives who left Africa, um, and that could be a lot because we're talking about, I mean, that could, you know, uh, we're talking about even if, you know, don't even worry about that because even we're talking about the, the uh, 12 to 14 percent of, of real uh, Africans came over here or we talking about the Marocans who, who, who hid who left to Africa and were came back on forced back by the selling of, of Africans the selling um, Africa um, selling you to foreign investors and bringing you to America to the Spanish or um, or it could just be lying so therefore don't worry about that because that's not the main cause because we that's not the foundation because we understand that about who we are so we're not worried about that the point is is that we were built we were being held uh, for slavery under these conditions under these new rules in these sugarcane fields and still was being killed with no justice being served after the emancipation So most sugar was cultivated in the Caribbean and South America, but the southern colonies of British America and subsequent states like Florida, Texas, and Louisiana. Florida, Texas, and Louisiana 
the most infamous of the sugar states entered a br brutal cash crop sweet stakes as well. You can see us up there on the on the wagon with the sugar cane and the mules. The most well-known portrait of the Louisiana sugarcane country comes from the Solomon, the Solomon North Up, the free black New Yorker famously kidnapped into slavery in 1841 and rented out by his master for New York on plantations. In his memoir, 12 Years a Slave, so that's where they get the movie, you know, that rendition of 12 Years a Slave. Northup recounts the hectic and barbaric scene that unfolded during the harvest season when enslaved people were pushed around the clock to gather the process the highly perishable sugar cane before it rotted. Northup writes, the hands are not allowed to sit down long enough to eat their dinners, carts filled with corn cake cooked at the kitchen and are driven into the field at noon. The cake is distributed by the drivers and must be eaten with the least possible um, with the least possible delay. The harvesters work relentlessly in blistering heat, hacking down ten foot cane with machete like knives and transporting it into plantation mills to be pro processed until they passed out from what appeared to be heat stroke. Then Northup tells us they were dragged into the shade doused with buckets of water and ordered back to their places in the cane. Slaves in Louisiana sugar cane world live what the former slave and the civil rights activist Frederick Douglass termed a life of living death. A life of living death. Frederick Douglass termed it a life of living death. The slaves in Louisiana sugar cane field lived a life of death. The average lifespan of the mill hand was said to be about 70 years old. Just 70 years. A message that circulated widely among enslaved people who feared being sold in bondage in the sugar field. Yeah, this is you. We talking about you, the indigenous Amaru Khan. Those who like they call they like to call you Indian. They like to call you all other type of names. Negro, colored. You the, are the indigenous, the aboriginal, the original Amaru Khan. They talking about you. You were a slave after slavery. And they still trying to make you a slave today. Unless you wake up. It's time to prophesy. It's time for you to wake up. A former slave in Memorist Jacob Stoyer wrote in the 19th century that the enslaved people, I mean that enslaved people saw Louisiana as a place of slaughter. When a train lurched out of the South Carolina station carrying slaves to Louisiana, Stoyer wrote, so they're coming from South Carolina to Louisiana on a train. Slaves on a train from South Carolina to Louisiana. The colored people cried out with one voice. The indigenous aboriginals cried out with one voice as though the heavens and the earth were coming together. And it was so pitiful that those hard-hearted hard white men who had been accustomed to driving slaves all their lives shed tears like children just from hearing, just from hearing our people cry because they didn't want to go to the Louisiana sugar fields. All right. So the sugar masters growers were in a vanguard of a mechanic uh, vanguard of mechanization using steam power road. Uh, so that just talks about how. Um, they started to use a uh, mechanical devices to uh, get that cane up out of there. So 
Man, as you can see the harsh punishment that we dealt with, this is even after slavery. Alright, so you can compare on how it still continues. Now there's one more thing on this uh, chart, which uh, I'm sure you've noticed, and that is this green dotted line. You see, the peak of their fortunes was the empire under David. Everything leads up to that, and then everything goes downhill from then on, until they lose the land. It's a tragic story, really. And, but that is why every Jew looks back to that period and longs for it to come back. That was the golden age. Lord, send us another David. Send us a, a Messiah like David. Send us the son of David. And still to this day, the Jewish people are looking for that son of David to come back and restore the prosperity. The last question the disciples asked Jesus before he ascended to heaven, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And still they're asking 2,000 years later. So that's the peak. And their fortunes on the whole were up and up and up to that point. But from then, down and down. Civil war, division between the ten tribes, the north and two in the south. It's all in the book of Kings, which is a very sad and sordid tale when you read it through. And of all the kings they had, most of them were bad. Many were assassinated. They had one dreadful queen, which we're going to talk about later. Just one, because it was God's will they should only have kings. And they had one dreadful queen. Uh, but we'll talk about that on another occasion. Well, now there it is. And then after this 400 year gap, during which they had no words from God and didn't see a single miracle, then suddenly it all started again. John the Baptist came preaching the first prophet for a long time and then the miracles came with Jesus and the birth, death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus starts our New Testament which only covers a hundred years or less so your whole New Testament was written in a hundred years whereas the Old Testament was written over two thousand and if you go back to creation how long? now this idea that the historical portion of the New Testament is false directly negates our position as Yah's people. Now before you cut me off, let me further explain that. As a people, we are still writing The, the fulfillment of Yah's covenant that we get in the Tanakh. Okay? So, if there is a blank historical slate between the end of the events in the Tanakh and now, it gives other cultures, namely the Jewish people from Russia, and other places who do not directly identify with the original Hebrews of scripture being a people of color and being known as Hebrew Israelites, it gives those people the opportunity to rewrite or to interject themselves into the missing place. One of the main propagators of a false New Testament are the people who have taken the identity of Yah's chosen people. Oh, do we want to keep that going on? Mm. Why? Because if your history is void, then I can rewrite your history. We've seen it on countless times here in America, where because nobody wrote down our history and because our ancestors were forbidden from reading and writing for a very large portion of the time um, that they were here in this country, then guess what? Our history is now told the lens of the victor. Right? Oh man. Has that happened already? Ooh. The one who has conquered and who has won. So to negate the validity of a history that tells the, one of the, the, the tell I mean come on that's the shit that those are all the bibliotecas that we are unscrambling now. Those are the the scriptures that we are unscrambling now we're unscrambling the Torah because man has has 
put his false has falsified our documents so understand that this is real time this is real spill so wake up israel point points of the brick hadashah the new testament is the rejection of the hamasiach because that's how we end up in our final captivity Ooh. how can we end up in a captivity for 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 nearly 400 years Ooh. for the same things that our ancestors end up ended up in captivity for for 70 years and 10 years and 20 years what made the the wound of the past so grievous that in order to to rectify or to to bring shalem restitution so that there can be shalom what what was so bad that our ancestors did that put us in this position we had always been pagan we always didn't listen to yah was he just like you know i'm just i'm just fed up 400 years for the for the, for the last generation or was there a key event where something happened where it turned the tables and it showed the true heart and intent of our people and yah said i have to purge that out and it's going to take this much time and then i'll bring them back to me because it doesn't make sense any other way and if there is that blotted out history then yes as a people how dare black people just pop up on the scene claiming to be something and then all this time from 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 second chronicles depending on if you have a seeper a, a seeper bible it's a fair or um to or from malachi until now where people are waking up or until the 70s when the people in demona went back into the land you know all of that time we were just nothing or was the prescription for our wound this captivity based upon something that happened in the land pre-70 ad those things have to be rectified when you're dealing in logic we are still writing the new testament if you don't believe in the new testament you don't believe in your place in fulfilling those things that have not been fulfilled in the tanakh what would you say sis those things that have not been fulfilled in the tanakh when we get things that have not been fulfilled in the tanakh oh. you don't believe in your place in fulfilling those we are still writing the New Testament. Right, if you right, don't right. believe in the New Testament, you don't believe in your place in fulfilling those things that have not been fulfilled in the Tanakh. All right, man. I can no. I can't, man. I cannot tell you all this over and over again. You gotta understand. All right. Forget about the naysayers. Okay, it's in you. It's in you, not on you. It's in you. Alright? Dig within to overstand. Embody. Yes, when sir. we get in, in our canonized version of the New Testament is an account during a specific time that gives us a marker. Right? And what we get in the transatlantic slave trade, transatlantic transatlantic slave trade is a marker based upon the things in Tanakh. It's still a portion of the fulfillment of scripture what you get in paul's writings and these other writings are one person or a few people's account of a marker in history they're giving markers right now there are us uh, there are some of us who are writing and putting forth information and restoring the identity to our people those are a mark right. those are markers that's right in history fulfilling scripture that's right this is the fulfillment of the New Testament. You being alive right now is the continual writing of the Brick Kata Shop. Halil Hawa. What you get in the book of the Revelation is a guide. Halil Hawa. Line based upon, based upon Torah and Tanakh that tells us where we stand in the scheme of time. So then to reject those markers, you're rejecting your position in writing the other portions of the New Testament. You are the New Testament. Halil Hawah. You are the fulfillment of Yah's promises in these last days. Halil Hawah.
So to say there's new, no New Testament, the reason why some of us go, uh, you know, look at you crazy is because you missed your marker. That's not good. Israel, stand up. Jacob, stand up. And you don't want to err on missing the, vis the visitation of Yah, as he says mm. in, um, in the book of Jeremiah. You, you don't want to. You want to be... Now, we're talking about in Jeremiah. All right? We're talking about in Jeremiah. All right? The visitation. Prepared for his visitation. And y'all know that Jeremiah is the Old Testament. These prophets, these prophets of the Old Testament, yeah, they talked about all of these things to come. To his people, and you need to use these markers and these historical things and not let other people who don't understand your markers convince you that your markers don't matter. So yeah, I got another article that was... That uh, went across my desk, man. I want to hit you over the head with it. It's about a Confederate general who was actually part of the Ku Klux Klan. Alright? This Civil War massacre that left nearly 200 black soldiers, so-called black soldiers, murdered. Oh, man. Shalom, people. Y'all stand up. I just want to uh, give y'all some more food. All right, so this was in the Washington Post. David Thomas, Senior Deputy Executive Director of the Veteran Administrative Office. So this was an administrative office of the Veteran Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization says he removed this painting from his office after a Washington Post reporter made him aware that its subject, Nathan Bedford, Forrest was a Confederate general and a slave trader who served as a Ku Klux Klan first leader. Alright? This guy right here on this white horse. Gonna remind you of the hell of the pale horse, Rex 84. But hey, check this out. Department of Veteran Affairs staff member dem demanded last week that a high ranking official remove from his office a painting title. Um, removed from his office a painting titled No Surrender which depicted a confederate general atop a horse riding across a snowy battlefield which is in the Americas in a petition workers explained that not only was the man featured in a painting a confederate general but he was none other than uh, Major General Nathan Bedford Forrest, a ruthless slave trader, the first Grand Wizard in the Ku Klux Klan, and the man who led Confederate forces in a bloody Civil War battle in 1864. 1864, that became known as Fort Pillow Massacre. The Fort Pillow Massacre. Y'all go check that out and look it up. The controversy over the painting led to two more questions. What is Fort Pillow? And what happened there? Alright. The battle to reign Fort Pillow began April 12, 1864, when Forrest led 2,500 Confederate cavalry in an attack on the fort about 40 miles north of Memphis. Alright. According to the National Park Service, the, the fort, alright, this is Memphis, Tennessee, we're talking about. The fort was held by Union troops including 295 white soldiers and 262 colored soldiers under the command of Major Lionel F. Boot. Alright. The Confederates including sharpshooters unleashed a storm of bullets on the fort killing Boot. Forrest demanded unconditional surrender although outnumbered by the Confederate soldiers Major William F. Bradford who had taken command of the Union troops refused to surrender. All right, so now these Union troops we talking about now these would be the blacks, right? The so-called black troops. Now William F. Bradford, who was who was just a major, uh, once his general had got killed. All right, killing Booth. 
Now Major William F. Bradford, right, would be taken over. All right, who had taken command of the Union troops. Now he refused to surrender. All right, so the Confederates and uh, were trying to get them to surrender, but get this Union to surrender. But he said no. Now this Union was formed with these 295 whites and these 262 blacks who was from the land. All right, so this is during a Confederate invasion where the federal government during an invasion in the land. All right, when the whites of uh, English had already been there, so they had already been there in 1864. So now they're fighting with the whites against some more whites. Okay, so Confederates renewed the attack soon. Uh, uh, Soon overran the fort and drove Federals down the river's bluff into the deadly cross. This is on the Missis all this is taking place on the Mississippi River, according to the Park Service. As many as 300 Union soldiers, including 200 black soldiers, were killed. Many were shot point blank in the head. All right, I'm gonna tell y'all how it happened. This is the scene over at uh, Pillow. All right, the photos taken between 1861 and 1865 shows guns mounted along the perimeter of Fort Pillow. Mac Leamy was the highest ranking Union officer to, to survive the, the battle. His eyewitness account, written nearly 30 years later on April 4, 1893, would stand as a testament to what happened at Fort Pillow. Our line broke and many troops Many of the troops threw down their muskets and rushed down the bluffs toward the river. The rebels, meanwhile, keeping up the murderous fire, Leeming wrote, according to the Gilder Leeming Institute of American History, a nonprofit group dedicated to history education. Many of the colored soldiers, seeing that no quarters were to be given, madly leaped into the river, okay, while the rebels stood on the banks or part way up a bluff and shot at the heads of their victims. Leeming, Leeming fell on the side of the bluff near the bank of the Mississippi River. I could plainly see this firing and note the bullets striking the water around the black heads of the soldiers until suddenly the muddy current became red and I saw another life sacrificed in cause of the Union. He wrote, then Leeming noticed the black soldier in the river clinging to his life. Two Confederate soldiers pulled him out. Leeming recalled. He seemed to be wounded and crawled on his hands and knees. Finally, one of the Confederate soldiers placed his revolver to the head of the colored soldier and killed him. Oh, man. Confederate soldiers pulled down the Stars and Stripes flag. Leeming wrote and hoisted the stars and bars. So these soldiers were farting for these stars and stripes. Just trying to have a union. We're convinced, but it seemed like they were. ambushed in a sense okay this is an 1864 photo shows officers of the 16th US Color Infantry Regiment atop Lookout Mountain Tennessee black units in the Civil War were commanded by white officers so these are all your officers that we were commanded by I write because most of our crew are colored and I feel now pay attention when I was just up here and he talked about uh, his battalion or these uh, this union that was all killed right the 200 black soldiers that remember this leader this major remember he said his life was saved usually when all your soldiers are killed your life is killed also but all right but Major Bradford, there's a lot that went on with this Major Bradford. Now, this major, it's crazy because this Major William Bradford, it connects 
to uh, another Bradford a hundred years later um, and <clears throat> this probably would connect to my great grandfather R.W. Bradford okay who was part of the Indian Choctaw Choctaws in the ninth Choctaws in the 1900s so this will leave us to the uh, to him being colored so therefore this William Bradford Major William Bradford or someone after him having slaves right and creating my great grandfather and my great grandfather marrying my great grandmother who was labeled as a slave alright so so it all goes together man so let's just finish it up he also detailed how the colored troops had been murdered by confederate soldiers okay I found many of the dead lying close along by the water edge where they had evidently sought safety they could not offer any resistance from the places where they were in holes and cavalids cavils uh, ca along the banks uh, Critchell wrote most of them had two wounds I saw several colored soldiers of the 6th United States artillery with their eyes punched out with bayonets many of them were shot twice and bayoneted also so the bayonet is the tip of that gun remember the tip of your rifle that was a sword that had a knife on it said their eyes were stabbed out both of them with the knife Critchell was appalled by the gruesome scene that 70 black soldiers lying dead along the Mississippi River uh, under the Mississippi River the Mesopotamia this is Moses this is from the Mesopotamia. This is the Mississippi River, the Nile Valley, the river that runs through the Amaru Khans. So going up into the fort, I saw their bodies partially consumed by fire. Whether burned before or after, I cannot say. Anyway, there were several companies of rebels in fort while these bodies were burning, and they could have pulled them out of the fire, but they had chosen not to. The Fort Pillow Massacre, y'all remember that, y'all looked that up, became a fervent rally cry among the Union troops, according to the National Park Service, and cemented resolve to see the war through its conclusion. Alright, so another massacre. This is after the emancipation. So I'm pretty sure that just from the uh, amount of evidence that the families who endeavored in these uh, will one day will one day be comp compensated. The Creator will make sure it happens. So for everything that's happened, there's been a trace that's left. There's been a trace that's left. For us to find and we will find it we are determined through the strength of Hawa we are determined to find it and we will so you can prepare yourself thy enemy because the truth is being revealed Shambhala style yes yeah, sure my message has to change because uh, the, the word of God speaks louder than what my thoughts are uh, I have to speak according to what the word of God says uh, so um, uh, let's listen at another video the sons of Jacob are European Jews really Gentiles whose ancestors converted to Judaism the facts are clear now 
that most of those who call themselves Jews are not descendants of Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel, and therefore have no claim to the land of Palestine. The October 29, 1996 New York Times, in an article entitled Scholars Debate Origins of Yiddish and the Migrations of Jews, states, the Eastern European Jews were not really Semitic, that they were largely descended from the Turkish Khazars, who converted to Judaism in medieval times. Therefore, modern Jews have no blood link to the biblical Israelites. Jewish historians have established that at least 90% of all Jews come from a Turkish mix of people and are largely sourced from the Khazar kingdom. The Jewish scholar Arthur Colster provided overwhelming evidence in his book titled The Thirteenth Tribe, showing that in the 8th century, Khazaria, which was greatly made up of the Turkish mixed people known as Khazars, converted to their national religion of Judaism, which was based on the Babylonian Talmud. He states in his book that the Khazar Empire, which in the Dark Ages became converted to Judaism, Khazaria was finally destroyed by Genghis Khan and its Mongol hordes, but evidence indicates that the Khazars themselves migrated to Poland and formed a Western Jewish community. As you can see, even Genghis Khan destroyed these Jews at first. They eventually migrated to other places like Germany and Russia. Christian churches and the general public have been deceived. Many Jewish historians are now admitting that they are not the true Hebrews of the Bible. And how can they be returning to the land of Israel when they were never there to begin with? Yeah, I want to thank uh, 432, I want to thank Curry Mayo, and I want to thank the Shabbatai man hitting you over the head. Y'all check out that Curry Mayo video, that last drop. Y'all subscribe. Curry Mayo and his tribe and his family over there, you got uh, one appointment. Y'all make sure y'all get to uh, Nepi. Y'all make sure y'all check Nepi out, man. He hitting you over the head with some drop, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, y'all make sure y'all check out Ab, Ab, uh, Aboriginal TV, man. Y'all check that out. It's a beautiful thing, man. And my Shabbat, Tom, my sister, Chef. Y'all stay up. Uh, Miss D. Copper Color, all my sisters. Y'all stay up, man. It's a beautiful thing. Y'all take care of these warriors out here, because we warriors for Hawashua and Hawa. You understand? It's the same damn thing. So, uh... Y'all read y'all scriptures, man. And I just want to leave y'all with this here. See, that's the one thing that's missing. A, a, a lot of the people that, that are speaking and teaching out here do not have the spirit. And the Bible says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So, so I'm a firm believer 